a blessed Christmas time with their families and remembering the, the birth of Christ. And now we're looking forward to a new year. That's always a good time for people to take a breather and think about their life. People oftentimes make uh, New Year's resolutions and things like that. And uh, then we break them by February. But it's always a good time to be thinking about, you know, are there things that God wants to do in my life this year? You know, things that maybe he wants to change in us. And uh, this morning, I'm going to share with you a message out of Luke chapter 6 about some of the areas that you might find... um, where you need to grow. I mean, I, re- I read this and I'm thinking, man, there's, there's some things for me here. And um, Jesus never runs out of things to teach us. You know that? I mean, you think sometimes, well, I've been saved for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or maybe even 40 years, and you think, well... I've heard it all before, but I'll tell you, he never runs out of things to teach us and to challenge us with. And um, ultimately, what he's after in our lives is our heart, isn't he? He wants our heart above everything else. And he's pursuing growth in our life that we would be like him. So with that in mind and that kind of Heart, let's pray and look to the word of the Lord today. Lord Jesus, I pray that as we look in your word, you would teach us by your spirit. Lord, make it alive to each of us. Give understanding and revelation to each person here by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, show us something more of Jesus, his nature, his character through the revelation of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Luke chapter 6. This might be a little bit hot in these uh, monitors down here, just a hair. Okay. (laughs) Then maybe it's hot up there. (laughs) Either that or my ears are going bad. I'm not sure which it is. Well, remember last week we talked about Jesus choosing the 12 apostles. He spent the night in prayer. And now this is really kind of the first time we see in in, uh, this story of Luke, anyhow, where he spends uh, a a big section of Scripture actually teaching them about what it means to be a follower. You know, Kathy, Kathy shared last night, and I thought it was really insightful how you know, when, when you were, if you were one of those disciples and you came down with, with, you know, when Jesus came down off the mountain and he said, I'm picking 12, and you were one of the ones that weren't chosen, you might have sat there with a thing like, man, I wonder why he didn't choose me. And then, and then Jesus starts laying out some of these, I don't know, what it means to be a disciple. You might have, you might have thought, well, I'm glad he didn't choose me. You know, good luck, Peter and you guys. That's the journey the Lord's taking you on because the Lord is uh, the title of my message today is called Probing of Our Soul. And the Lord is going to get into our stuff in these scriptures. These are, these are very challenging scriptures to all of us. And there's not a person here this morning that if you, if you want to listen and hear what he's saying, won't be challenged by some of the things that Jesus is talking about. And I want you to know that when Jesus confronts us about, you know, areas of our life like this, it's because he's searching for growth in us. It's not to bring condemnation and it's not to destroy us. It is to, it is to say, hey, here's some areas where you can grow. So in verse 20, after he came down off the mountain, he chose the twelve. Looking at his disciples, he said, 
I'm going to go ahead and read through this entire portion of Scripture. It's, it's quite lengthy, and I'm going to make a few comments. I'm going to come back next week and the week after and share a little bit more detail, or, or sometime in the next few weeks, share more detail about individual sections. But today I want to just give you a broad overview. So it says, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor. Matthew's, Matthew, if you read the scriptures in Matthew, it's, it's kind of a parallel of this. He says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. But as soon as I read this word, blessed are you who are poor, I wonder, does Jesus really know what he's talking about? Because that doesn't sound like a blessing, does it? For yours is the kingdom of God. Then he says, blessed are you who hunger. Does that sound like a blessing? Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now. Does that sound like a blessing? You will laugh. Listen to this. Blessed are you when men hate you. Does that sound like a blessing? So all of a sudden, in these very first teachings of Jesus to his disciples, he's really saying things that, that, that kind of go cross grain to the thinking of most people. It doesn't, doesn't seem to compute. He's talking about things that seem like they're upside down in some way. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, and when they insult you. These don't sound like blessings. And when they reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. And then he, he goes on, doesn't say just that you are blessed. He says rejoice in that day. And leap for joy. I'll tell you what, when you have people who hate you and people who exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man, I don't see too many of us leaping for joy. We're thinking, man, Jesus, what, what are you talking about? And then he goes on in verse 24, Woe to you who are rich. Woe. Let's just see how, see how counter this is to the thinking of man. Woe to you that are rich. And, and I'll develop that somewhat in the future. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it this morning. For you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now. For you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now. For you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when all men speak well of you. For that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. Twenty seven. But I tell you who hear me, here's some more of this stuff. This kind of cross grain to how we think. Love your enemies. Now, when we read these things, we're trying to find there's got to be a different interpretation for this stuff, isn't there, Lord? I mean, let me, let me find the 26 translations of the Bible and see if I can see what this really means here. Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. You see how these things, if you sit down and really read these things, how they can probe into your soul? He's... he's He's provoking us. He's provoking our selfishness. He's provoking our pride. He's provoking our self-sufficiency. And he's pushing those buttons. And he's telling you, this is the way it really is. This is how it is in my kingdom. This is what it means to be a disciple. Bless those who curse you. 
Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. I'm not going to do that. There must be a different interpretation here. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Anybody have a tunic? Give to everyone who asks you. If anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. I mean, aren't these things pretty radical? If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those that are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those to whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. That's an important statement there. Because he's trying to differentiate his children from what he calls sinners here, those who don't know him. He's saying, why would you want to be just like everybody else? I want to differentiate you. I want, I want you to be walking in my ways. And so when you do these things, it's like you're a chip off the old block. You're like your father who is in heaven. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And he says, be merciful, just as your father is merciful. Do not judge, you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And he also told this parable, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher. Everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. That's another important principle, what I'm sharing today. A student is not above his teacher. Everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and you pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own? Does anybody, does anybody uh, struggle with that one? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You, I mean, Jesus, what are you doing here trying to scare away your disciples? And what he's doing is he's pushing for change. He's pursuing their heart. He's saying, look, you are followers of me now. Now truly follow me. And this is what I'm like. And this is how I act. And this is how I treat. And this is what I want for you. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. And then a very important principle for what I'm going to say this morning. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I say. I will show you what this man is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation on the rock. The flood came, the torrent struck that house, but it could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed. And his destruction was complete. This was the disciples' introduction to what it means to following Jesus. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I look at that list and I read it, 
I mean, I, it's, like, it's kind of like some of this stuff your heart balks at, doesn't it? It's like, is this really what you expect from me, Lord? And we, and we try to find another scripture that would balance it out, like, well, maybe he meant this, or like I say, we try to find a different translation, or somehow we, we talk ourselves out of the simple interpretation of these things. Or, or in some way we feel justified about not loving my enemy or not turning my other cheek. It's the American way. Or, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a self-made man or whatever, you know, whatever comes up in our hearts. But when I read this and I find that it goes cross-grain to my heart or my philosophy or my way of thinking, there's another, another possible option. That is that my heart is really out of sync with, with Jesus. And my heart really isn't lined up with how he wants it to be. And there's something inside of me that still rises up against, against these things. And, you know, we can be walking in the Lord, for, like I said, 10, 20, 30 years and still struggle with some of this stuff. And what I would like to do this morning is challenge us that I think the, the reality is our hearts are out of sync. And just say, Lord, something needs to happen inside. I don't, I don't want to change the scripture. I don't want to change that. But Lord, if, I, if, I, if, if the hackles on me rise up when I read this stuff and somehow I find resistance toward this and I, and I stand against it and I balk against it and I justify my own position, then maybe, maybe, maybe my heart needs to be plowed up some more so that I become a man who's more in sync with Jesus Christ. Well, there's three ways that Jesus provokes them here. And I want to focus a little bit of time on that. In verse 27, he says, I say unto you who hear. So what does that mean for you who hear? Was he talking about people who physically could not hear? Or was he talking about people who hear? I think he's talking about people who hear. And so in the middle of all these disciples, he's saying, I'm speaking to those of you who really hear me. Because we can sit under the teaching of his word for years and years and years and not hear. It can just kind of fall on deaf ears. Or we can let it brush off, you know, and kind of go around us. Or we can daydream or what have you. But Jesus is saying, of all my disciples that are out here, those of you who hear me, those of you who really get what I'm saying, love your enemies. Because there are some people who never will hear that. There's a scripture in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 43, that Jesus says this, Why do you not understand my speech? And the answer he gave, it's even because you cannot hear my word. And what he's saying is there are people there, these Pharisees and others, who were listening to the teachings of Jesus and for whatever reason resisting or rejecting them or standing against them. And Jesus is saying, why don't you really understand my speech? And again, it wasn't he was speaking a foreign language. He wasn't speaking things they couldn't understand. It's because they were rejecting what he had to say. And that's really what he's saying here to these disciples. I'm speaking to those of you who hear me. And so the question you've got to ask yourself, do I? Do I hear Jesus? When I read these, these scriptures, he talks about loving my enemy and blessed are you who are hunger, hungering now because you'll be filled. And those seem to go you know, counter to my thinking. And I, and I kind of put them on the shelf because I don't want to deal with that at this point in my life. 
I'm wondering if I'm really hearing him. I'm wondering if I've opened my ears up. The scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, there were people in chapter 5 verse 11 who became dull of hearing. They were disciples. They were followers of Jesus Christ. And Paul was, in a sense, rebuking them when he wrote to them. He said, you guys ought to be able to teach others. You ought to be mature at this point, but you become dull of hearing. And no longer does the Word of God have a place to cut in. It's like I'm dull. I don't hear anymore. And so Jesus is talking to people who hear me. He says, if you hear me, love your enemy. If you hear me, do good to those that hate you. If you hear me, give. If you hear me, forgive. Second Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4, there's a warning to us about people who would turn away from the truth, turn away their ears from hearing the truth. So the first thing that Jesus does to provoke these people, there's a whole crowd of people here. He's laying out some very deep teaching. He's probing into the inner, innermost parts of their being. He's touching on their selfishness and all their human inadequacies. And he says, if you really hear me, do these things. All right, the next way he provokes them and he provokes us is he sets a very high bar, a bar. And he says that by these words in Luke 6, verse 40, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect or complete or mature is that word. Everyone who is perfect or complete or mature shall be as his master. What is he saying here? He's saying, he's, he's telling these people this teaching which, which I'm sure is stirring up the hearts of everybody in that, in that congregation, everybody who was around there, and he's saying, look, I'm your master, and everyone who is mature will be like the master. So he's setting a very high bar, but to me, it's a, it's a message of hope as well, because when Jesus tells me, Kirk, love your enemy, and I say, Lord, how can I love my enemy? I have this thing in my heart toward revenge or toward hatred, or I can't stand it when people take advantage of me. How can I really love my enemy? And Jesus says, everyone who is mature will be like the master. And I'm saying, Lord, I want to be like you. I want to be like you. And so, yes, it's a high bar because he's challenging all my human selfishness but at the same time, he's given me a hope that he can change me. He's going to change me to be more like Jesus. And so if you're here today and you're a person who can't love your enemy, you can't turn the other cheek, you can't forgive, you can't, all these things that Jesus talked about, get a hope that Jesus is saying to you, if you are my disciple, if you are my student, and if you truly hear me, I'm going to make you more like me. I'm going to make you more like me. And it's a message of great hope for any of us who struggle with these concepts here. So it's not a condemning thing. He, he's throwing it out there and he's saying, look, look at what you are becoming as you yield to me. Look at what I'm making you. This is the heart of God. And so the question I've got to ask myself is, do I really want to be like Jesus? Do I want to be like him? That's, that's the whole, if you want to, I don't want, I hate to use the word goal, but that's the whole goal of Christian growth. To become more like Jesus Christ. We, we, can't, we can't go years and years in our, in our faith without change. Change happens. Things take place because he's, he's rooting out these areas in my life that I resist. In Luke 6, 36, I already mentioned it. I read it earlier, but just to, to emphasize again this idea that he's wanting us to be like him, it says in verse 36, be merciful as your father is merciful. What is he saying there? He's saying he, he, he's, he's, he's setting up the Father in the Father's heart, a merciful heart. He's saying, 
This is what I want you to be like. Look at how your father is kind and compassionate, even to the ungrateful. And he's saying, I want you to be this same way. And so, so he's, he, he's, you know, provoking us to become more like Jesus. And then the third thing Jesus did to provoke them is he pressed them for a surrender. At the end of all this, it's almost like these guys are just filleted. You know, they're like cut wide open. Everybody's sitting there like, ugh, you got to be kidding me. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm up for this, Lord. And Jesus, at the very end of all this, he wraps it up and he says, why do you call me Lord if you won't do what I say? See, it's easy, it's easy just to call him Lord. But it's another thing altogether to live out his lordship in my life. And he says, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I'm going to say? In the context of all that are the things we just talked about. Why would you call him Lord if you don't love your enemy? Why would you call him Lord if you won't do good to those who spitefully use you, pray for those who abuse you? See, he's really putting the rubber to the road, isn't he? He's saying, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm making you. This is, this is the work I'm doing in your life. And when you call me Lord, that means, the word Lord means the controller. And we are saying, Jesus, you are the controller of my life. You are the Lord of my life. I've surrendered my life to you. And he says, okay, if that is the case, if I am the Lord, then do what I say. So the question I'm asking myself, and we got to ask each other is, am I, am I really building on sand or am I building on a solid rock? Because he said those who hear and do what he says are building on a solid foundation. Those who hear and don't do are building on sand. Isn't that good stuff? And then I'll, I'll, I have just a few things here. If you, we're going to have a baptism here in just a minute. If you guys want to get ready and uh, close up here in just a minute or two. And here's, here's three things that Jesus did to, I guess, set a vision in front of them, a motivation for change. First of all, he helped them to see that there is a kingdom of God that is very real. Jesus said to his disciples one time, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. You know, Bill had a, a, an exhortation to us this morning or a word of encouragement that sometimes we just don't see the reality of, of the kingdom. But there, you know, there's a kingdom that the principles of the kingdom are with us now and we live them out. But there is a, there is a future, a heaven, a place we're going to go, a place where Jesus said, I am going and I'm preparing a place for you. And he said, if it wasn't true, I would have told you that. I'm fully expecting one day to die and be with Jesus forever. And he's got a place for me. I fully expect that. And my life, my life on the earth, whether it's, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, or whatever it is, is just a speck of time compared to what he has for me. And so often, we, we are so narrow in our thinking that all we, all we really see is this little speck of time, this what the Bible calls a vapor. It's a vapor compared to eternity. And we, we have so much of our time and our energy and our love and our emotion and our compassion for this this here, we're not even thinking about preparing for 
Jesus talked about laying up in store for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's because there's something coming. There's something over there. There is something down the road. And am I really preparing for it? Do I really value the kingdom of God? And so Jesus told these people, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm telling you, if you're poor, you probably don't think, well, great, the kingdom of heaven is there. But Jesus is saying, this is what is there for you. Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. There is so much more. And the thing is, sometimes we just don't value it. So, so the thing that Jesus is trying to give them a vision for is this, is this future, this kingdom, this heaven. Here's what it says in Matthew 13, verse 44. Listen to this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, the which when a man is found that he hides it. And for joy, he goes and sells everything he has to buy that field. Now get the picture. You're out walking around in a field one day. It's not your property. You're walking around. Oh, my goodness, look at this treasure. You want it so bad, you hide it so nobody else can find it. You stick it away under a rock or something, and you say, i got to buy this field. I wonder what it costs. And so you go to everything. I sell my house, my car, my clothes. I'm going to keep something, but I'm selling everything I have. I'm selling. I'm selling. I'm giving it all because I want to raise as much money as I can because I want that. And that's what Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like. A man who sees it, who really understands the treasure, the value of this treasure, is willing to sell everything he has to go buy that field so he can have that treasure. I wonder if we value the kingdom of heaven like that. That's what he calls us to. to that, that everything is subservient to that. Everything is second to that. And part of the motivation Jesus gives to these people, blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. We will never understand the blessedness of that kind of poverty he's talking about, poor in spirit. We'll never understand the blessing of that if we don't understand the value of what he's giving us. And we'll sit here and say, well, to me, it's more blessed to be rich than poor. Jesus, you're saying it's woe woe to be rich and blessed to be poor. What's the difference here? Because we really haven't grasped the value of the kingdom. The second thing he encouraged them with was to have our eyes focused on eternity. It's kind of a similar thing. But he told us in Luke Luke 6, 21, Hunger now, now, for you will be filled. Weep now, for you will laugh. Verse 23, he says, your reward is great in heaven. Verse 35, he says, your reward is great in heaven. In Romans 8, verse 18, Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul was talking about actually going through suffering and persecution and trials in his life, which which, which for many of us, if we went through the things that Paul went through, we would be so discouraged so defeated, so down and out, so wondering why God has left me. And Paul is saying, look, the sufferings of this present time aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in me. He had a vision for what was ahead. He saw the future. There are many people in the Bible who had a vision for what God was doing. Abraham went because he saw something. Moses left Egypt because he saw something. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He saw something. Do we see? Do we see something? Something that captures our imagination, something that captures our heart, that we're willing to say that whatever I struggle through in this life isn't even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. That's the motivation Jesus laid out to these men. Your reward will be great. In heaven.
I fully expect that there will be rewards in heaven. And you might say, well, I, I, I'm not that big on awards. Hey, if Jesus has given out awards, I want them. I want them. So, Lord, <laughs> help us understand the value of this, that we don't invest our entire life in just what can I get now. It's like looking, it's looking to the future. Do not lay up treasures on the earth where rust and moths corrupt them. Lay up treasures in heaven, Jesus said. <coughs> Finally, in Luke 6.22, he said, if you suffer for the sake of the Son of God. I want to, I don't really understand fully this idea of living my life for the sake of Jesus, but it's, 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 it's almost like putting his heart and his priority on the things that I do for the sake of Jesus. There's a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that says, verse 10, Paul says, I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproach. He's saying I'm taking pleasure in this. Pleasure in infirmities, pleasure in reproaches, pleasure in necessities, pleasure in persecutions, and in distresses. For Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You might say, well, I can't love my enemy. I would say, do it for Christ's sake. I can't turn the other cheek. Do it for Christ's sake. Do it for Christ's sake. Do it for the sake of the kingdom. But he's, what he's doing in these scriptures is he's revealing the selfishness of the human heart. And the reason why these things go counter, counter grain or cross grain to our thinking is because we still have so much of me that's there. And Jesus in his grace is wanting to root that out. And as he calls us to be disciples, as he calls us to be followers of him, he doesn't leave those stones unturned. Thank God for his graciousness to deal with my selfishness. So let's pray. You can stand with me. We'll pray and uh, be seated when we're done. We're going to have a baptism. Lord Jesus, I pray that we are people who truly hear that our ears are open to your speaking to us, Lord, to your word, to your spirit. And Father, I pray for anyone in this room today that struggles with some of the things that you taught in this portion of Scripture, that you would help us realize that the issue is not your word, it is not you, it is my heart. And Father, I pray you change us. Change me, Lord. Change us so our hearts are in sync with yours, so that we see things your way. And, Lord, that there would not be a resistance or a stubbornness or an unyielded spirit within any of us. But when you ask the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say, we would say, Lord, I call you Lord because I want to do what you say. Enable us for that by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Here, here. Church this morning, I stopped at the store real quick, and uh, there was a man outside, and he uh, came around the corner and asked me for some money, and um, he surprised me, and I, I told him no, and uh, walked away, and because typically I don't give money to people, it was a small amount of money because I don't like to give them money because I think they're going to spend it on booze or cigarettes, and I walked away. And, Instantly, I thought, you know, I, that was an opportunity. I could have asked more questions. I could have offered, because we typically ask people, well, what do you need the money for, and, and offer to buy them food. And I didn't do that, and I walked away convic convicted as soon as I walked away and came here and re 
repented. And, and so I'm glad, like, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going all around, but I'm glad for the sermon today. I'm glad um, there's some of those scriptures that are easy for me to do, and some are very difficult. Amen. And I was glad um, to get this sermon today. It really helped me, and you know, I'm sorry for that guy that I missed that opportunity for, with him today, but I'm glad for the reminder. And I'm just. <laughs> All righty. Okay. Hi, this is Aaron McMahon. He's my buddy. Um, he lives he lives by the Orns, and so over the years he's kind of been kind of all around. You know, he's been around them and everything. And just recently he started getting more involved. Me and him got a lot closer, and uh, it was, I think it was this fall he uh, he got saved. He he asked he he knew that's what he needed. He knew he needed the Lord as a savior, and he got saved. And so I was talking to him about getting baptized, you know, following, following through with that. And uh, so just uh, I'm thankful that he wanted to do this. So you got anything you want to say, Aaron? Not really. I'm nervous. Are you nervous? Well, Paul, you got something? Well, for, first off, I wanted to, because I, I know there's probably other people who haven't been baptized around here. Uh, I know one in particular who's who's been asking about it, and so we have something Kirk does a lot. It's called the ABCs of baptism. Do we have that ready? Do we have that set up? <laughs> Sorry, I should have told him. I could. No, I, I I need the verses along with it actually. Okay. Well, you know what? But, but while we're waiting for that, I'm going to pray for Aaron here. Father, I thank you so much for Aaron. I thank you so much that, that you put him in my life uh, to help him, to guide him. And Lord, even to bless me, he's blessed me in return so much. He's just such a joy to have around. And Lord, I, I, I just I thank you so much for him. And I ask that, that he would um, be inspired, that he would um, be, be filled with the Spirit, that he would uh, carry out your works, Lord, just as you say uh, that, that he should be baptized, that he would also be baptizing people. And so I, I ask, Lord, that you would bless him in this area. In Jesus' name. Do you have it ready? Okay. So the ABCs of baptism. First, we got all believers in Christ are to be baptized. We have the verse, uh, when they believe, Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And those who accept his message were baptized. This is people after they got saved. You know, we, we have a lot of people, well, I was, I was baptized as an infant. You weren't saved. You just didn't know Christ. And it, it's no problem being baptized when you're an infant. It just means you got to do it again. <laughs> Buried with Christ uh, in baptism. Uh, it says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So in baptism, we go down. We, we're up here. We're an old man. We go down. We come up a new man. It's awesome. Circumcision of Christ through baptism. In him also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, but by, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power, uh, powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So we got, you know, originally we had the, the physical circumcision. Now we have a spiritual circumcision. We go on, another C, <laughs> calling upon his name. And now uh, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. That's what Aaron wants to do today. Disciple of Christ. Our fathers are, are uh, we're all under the, uh, the cloud. 
all, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And then we, we see also Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So, Aaron, you want to become a disciple, right? You, you, want, to, you want to be following, and, and I mean, I know you've already been, been doing that. You're going to continue to do that. And then evangelism. So here he is. He's the one, you know, being evangelized too. He's the one getting baptized. Now he's the one who's going to be going out and making the disciples. He's going to be the one who's baptizing them. And so I, I just think this is a really great thing. And I hope you, you understand, you know, you're going to be changed. You know, this is more, you already, you've already been saved. This isn't salvation. We know that. But this is, this is a change in your heart. And, and there are things that change. So, um, Paul, you want Hey, uh, before we're dismissed, uh, we got a prayer request from the hospital. Um, Christina Hinojosa had a baby uh, Thursday, and I guess there's some complications. She needs a, a blood transfusion, which she'll feel a lot better after the blood transfusion, I'm sure, but uh, she's a little nervous about the whole procedure. So could you join with me as I pray for her? Let's bow our heads. Father God, we just pray for Christina, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you'd be with her, that you'd comfort her, Lord, that the procedure would go well, that... Uh, she would get back the strength that she needs, Lord God, and that you would heal her body, Lord God. I just thank you for the opportunity just to even pray and glorify you through this. And as a body, we can pray together and, and hold one another up, Lord. We just thank you for Christina and the new child. And we just pray that your hand would be upon them both in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.